What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you're having a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing I wanna talk about today is our douchebag of the day. Now, earlier this month, you may have heard about a Colorado man that was stabbed for looking like a neo-Nazi. August 16th, Joshua Witt decides that he wants a shake, so he drives to his local steak and shake. When he gets out of the car, he is reportedly approached by a man who asks, are you one of them neo-Nazis? But before Witt could even answer, the attacker raises a knife above his head. Witt tries to block the attack, he gets stabbed in the hand, at which point, for better and worse, the assailant runs down a nearby bike path and disappears. So luckily Josh survives. He takes photos of his injuries, the crime scene, and he posts on Facebook. So apparently I look like a neo-Nazi and got stabbed for it. Luckily I put my hands up to stop it so he only stabbed my hand. Please keep in mind there was no conversation between me and this dude. I was literally just getting out of my car. And Witt later described his attacker as a black man in his mid-twenties, five foot ten, wearing a green shirt and blue pants. And as you could guess, the story quickly got picked up and it spread like wildfire. And the reason we're talking about this story today is the attacker has been caught, but it turns out the attacker is Joshua Witt. It turns out that Joshua Witt made it all up. Now, police said that they were suspicious from the start. For one thing, the parking lot that this was supposed to have taken place in was a very busy one and no one reported this. Secondly, the photos that he posted on Facebook showed a lot of blood for what was a relatively minor injury. Thirdly, police said that he did not have a neo-Nazi style haircut at the time. In his Facebook profile photo, he had this little side fade, but authorities said that at the time of the incident, it was closer to this cut from his mugshot. And lastly, when the police tried to find the footage of someone running off towards the bike path, they couldn't find it. But they did find footage of Witt buying a small knife at a nearby sports store. When questioned about this, Witt admitted to the lie. And the Sheridan County Police Chief Mark Campbell said, he was opening up the knife package in the car and he cut himself. I don't believe he showed any remorse. Our take is, he kind of made this up and it got out of control when it went on Facebook. Witt has since been arrested for filing a false report and if he is convicted, he faces up to a year in jail and a fine of $2,650. So that's the story, now let me speak on it. I have two reactions to this. The first being, what? What a huge douchebag piece of shit. You faked a hate crime for what? Facebook likes? You've made Joey Salads' race baiting ass look tame. Just a garbage person doing garbage things. And my second reaction to this is why did you admit it? I mean, understand this is coming from a person that thinks that you are a garbage person. You came up with the idea of faking a hate crime. You then actually did it. But then when the police seemingly only had evidence that you had also purchased a knife, like that's literally it. You fully admit the crime? I mean, where is your hate filled follow through? Like why are you planning and going through with something so despicable and then the first First time someone's like, but did it really happen? You completely crumble. But anyway, I hope you get the maximum punishment here. But a question I wanna pass off to you with this story is what do you think about that punishment? I feel like more and more, possibly in connection with the rise of social media, we see a lot of people faking crimes, making false accusations either to infuriate or just draw attention to themselves. And what do you think the punishment should be? Do you think a year makes sense? It should be lesser? Do you think it should be more? I'd love to know what you think on this. But from there, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome. And the first bit of awesome is HBO is released a just under 13 minute video of the behind the scenes of the finale. Something I thought I'd share since we're all going to have to wait for way too long for this show to come back. But hey, at least Westworld season two will hold us over when that's released in spring of 2018. Why are you doing this to me, HBO? Then we got the slow-mo guys showing off mid-air paintball collisions. Then we got a short film for Blade Runner 2049, and I don't mean it's like fan-made. Collider put out a prequel short film to show what happened in 2036. So if you need a little something to quench your thirst, highly recommend. And if you want to see the full versions of everything, I just shared the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links as always are in the description down below. Then in quick YouTube news, YouTube announced some changes today. Some you may have already recognized. First thing up, YouTube logo change. It went from this to this. Oh my God, it's so bold and daring. Or is this YouTube's way of saying the plays matter more than YouTube? No, probably not. Although, I mean, they are a company. That is the case. Also now on mobile, just like the desktop version, you'll be able to change playback speed. And the most important update actually has to do with vertical video. Vertical video, which has always looked horrible on YouTube with those black bars on the side will now adapt to your screen. Now keep in mind this is for the YouTube app on your mobile devices. It doesn't appear that this changes the desktop experience. So do be warned if you are someone that is wanting to embrace vertical video on the new YouTube app, you can do that. But still know that statistically speaking around 30 to 50% of people will still get those black bars if they're watching the desktop version. Then we have fantastic news for anyone that currently shops for food at Whole Foods or wants to. Now that Amazon has successfully purchased Whole Foods, they have changed two things. The first and the biggest thing 
is that they have changed the prices. Reports saying that they cut prices by as much as 43%. One of the examples provided in Manhattan, Fuji apples would sell for $3.49 a pound, now just $1.99 a pound, and also you were paying $3.49 for a pound of apples? Whatever, also people from California rejoice avocados went down around 80 cents. Oh, and the second change to Whole Foods is that you can now buy an Amazon Echo or Dot in the store. You know, cause sometimes when you go to Whole Foods for organic kale, you're like, why don't I also buy one or two Echoes? Also for those of you wondering why you can't go to Amazon and buy an Echo right now, most likely it's because they put all their stock in these stores. So there was that. Then let's talk about this recent Hollywood controversy that has a lot of people cheering and booing. Last week it was announced that British actor Ed Screen, who's best known for his roles in Deadpool and Game of Thrones, was recently cast to be in the Hellboy reboot. Specifically, he was set to play the role of Major Ben Daimyo, who in the comic books is Asian. And as you'd expect, some people were unhappy with this casting decision, calling it another example of Hollywood whitewashing a character. And this isn't a new topic or controversy for Hollywood. For example, this year Scarlett Johansson played the lead in Ghost in the Shell. That character originally was Asian. In the original, the character is called Major Matoko Kusanagi. In the film, Scarlett Johansson is simply called Major. We can even look to this week, Netflix released a Japanese manga adaptation of Death Note. That drew criticism for transferring a Japanese story to Seattle, and also because the film stars two white leads in parts that were originally written as Japanese characters. Although my personal favorite was the Emma Stone backlash, because in the movie Aloha, she played a character that was Chinese and Hawaiian. You also had the Doctor Strange backlash, but you get the point, it's, it's not new. But this time something new did happen. In response to the criticism, Ed announced that he is stepping down from the role. And he shared this statement on his Twitter, saying, last week it was announced that I would be playing Major Ben Daimyo in the upcoming Hellboy reboot. I accepted the role, unaware that the character in the original comics was of mixed Asian heritage. There has been intense conversation and understandable upset since that announcement, and I must do what I feel is right. It is clear that representing this character in a culturally accurate way holds significance for people, and that to neglect this responsibility would continue a worrying tendency to obscure ethnic minority stories and voices in the arts. I feel it is important to honor and respect that. Therefore, I have decided to step down so the role can be cast appropriately. Representation of ethnic diversity is important, especially to me as I have a mixed heritage family. It is our responsibility to make moral decisions in difficult times and to give voice to inclusivity. It is my hope that one day these discussions will become less necessary and that we can help make equal representation in the arts a reality. I'm sad to leave Hellboy, but if this decision brings us closer to that day, it is worth it. I hope it makes a difference. With love and hope, Ed Screen. And there was a lot of support. Hellboy producers Larry Gordon and Lloyd Levin supported his decision, saying in a statement, Ed came to us and felt very strongly about this. We fully support his unselfish decision. It was not our intent to be insensitive to issues of authenticity and ethnicity, and we will look to recast the part with an actor more consistent with the character in the source material. Also, the creator of the Hellboy comic book, Mike Mignola, wrote, thank you, Ed, very nicely done. Ming Na Wen of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. wrote, love this guy. Ed, you are a rock star. Now let's hope the recast is as morally and ethnically correct. And David Harbour of Stranger Things, who's also starring in the reboot, wrote, hey, internet, thank you for your voices. An injustice was done and will be corrected. Many thanks to Ed for doing what is right. But of course, as you'd expect, there are people that were criticizing this move. Some saying that it's the white actors being treated unfairly here. And not just in generalities, but even pointing to this Hellboy reboot. One writing, let's not forget Alice Monaghan, who is a pale red-headed Irish woman from 50s Ireland in the Hellboy comics, is a black woman in the new movie. I guess we'll be seeing her drop out of the movie too now, right? And I wanna use that comment as a question I pass off to you. Is there a difference? Is there a difference between Ed coming in to play a character that was Asian in the original and Sasha Lane coming in to play someone that was Irish in the original? Some are going to argue that those situations are the same and it's ridiculous that only one actor is being persecuted for that. Only one actor is being pressured to step down. Whereas those who see those situations as different are most likely going the angle of inclusion. The roles in TV shows and movies for the most part have been majority white. And many people would argue that this is about inclusion. It's it's easier to, to swap roles here, whereas the other could be seen as a majority taking away from another. And I have to say personally on this topic, I kind of just don't care. And I don't mean about the story in general, I just mean I don't care who plays certain roles based off of gender or race. You wanna make Spider-Man black? Cool. You wanna make Thor a woman? Fine. A previously white character is now played by someone that's black, someone that was previously Asians played by someone that's uh, white. But I say that also understanding that's coming from my life experience and who I am. Right, it was never a big deal that someone that had the same color as my skin was in the entertainment I was consuming. Also, I don't think all changes and adaptations are equal. Right, the answer to the question of why are we making this change is important. So to everyone, what are your thoughts here, but also specifically to people without my same background. What are your thoughts here? Also, while we're talking about this, I kind of want to attach another story to it. Here we were talking about the world of entertainment, but then let's also talk about fashion. And the reason for that is, once again, Kendall and Kylie Jenner are in the news because they are being accused of stealing. This time, not being accused of stealing specific images or specific designs, but being culture vultures. This because on their Kendall and Kylie store, they released an oversized plaid shirt for the low, low price of $145. They also posted this picture to their their Instagram. And many people called this style culture theft. A 
accusing the Jenners of stealing chola chola culture. That is the whitest that phrase has ever been said. Just a few of the responses. Laugh my ass off, first black culture and now chola culture? I'm happy more people are learning to accept and appreciate the beautiful culture, but people gotta stop stealing shit. If they're going to appropriate culture, they could at least be like, hey guys, our new clothing line is inspired by Latinx culture. And since all of the backlash, the Kendall Kylie Instagram removed that post, but they also left the page to buy the shirt up. So they're sorry, but not sorry. And so the question I wanna pass off to you here, I mean, obviously the situation is different. We're not talking about people, we're talking about styles and cultures. I'm more of the mindset of in entertainment and maybe the same is said about style. You're, you're always borrowing, you're always taking from something else and trying to make it your own. But also sure, there is a difference between uh, having a style for yourself and taking it for yourself and monetizing it for the masses. But at the same time, we're talking about a $145 plaid shirt. I don't know, let me know what you think. And then let's talk about North Korea in the news. As I was uploading yesterday's video, North Korea decide to launch a missile over Japan. South Korean military intelligence saying the missile was launched from a site very close to Pyongyang. The missile flew towards and over Japan, eventually breaking up into three pieces about 1,100 kilometers past Japan in the Pacific Ocean. Now, a big thing to note is this is not the first time North Korea has done this. They pulled this stunt in 1998, 2009, 2012, and 2016. But this is still a huge development because all those other missiles were for satellites in different stages of development. This missile was a military one. And while this move wasn't a complete shock, as North Koreans have stated as part of their plan to strike Guam, they would test missiles over Japan. Still probably not pleasant for the people in Japan to wake up at 6.02 to a message that reads, missile launched, missile launched, a missile has been launched from North Korea. Please evacuate to a sturdy building or underground. That also met with these alarms. <laughs> I'm done. Imagine how horrifying that is. Not knowing what was going to happen for 15 minutes until you get the update message. Missile passed. It seems the missile has passed over the area. If you find any suspicious object, please do not go near it and inform the police or the fire department. And since the Prime Minister of Japan responded by telling reporters, we must put strong pressure on North Korea to make it change its policy. Japan will work with the United States and South Korea and will also urge China, Russia, and the rest of the world to increase pressure on the North as well. Adding this launch of a North Korean missile is an unprecedented, serious, and grave threat to Japan. Adding that Trump told him the U.S. stands with Japan 100%. And I would like to make the utmost effort to protect the lives and assets of the Japanese people under a strong alliance between Japan and U.S. South Korea also responded by releasing this footage of a recent missile test that shows they can accurately hit targets hundreds of kilometers away. Also, South Korea went ahead and tested eight bunker busters near the border yesterday as a show of force. Maybe as a way of saying to the North, hey, Kim Jong-un, if you actually do this, we will get you. South Korean Major Lee kuk no told reporters our Air Force will wipe out the leadership of the North Korean regime with a strong strike capability if it threatens the security of our people in the South Korea-U.S. alliance with nuclear weapons and missiles. And President Trump made it clear that, quote, all options are on the table when it comes to dealing with North Korea. And as far as where China is on this, a foreign ministry spokeswoman said the situation was now at, quote, a tipping point approaching a crisis. Adding at the same time, there is an opportunity to reopen peace talks. We hope relevant parties can consider how we can de-escalate the situation on the peninsula and realize peace and stability on the peninsula. So, you know, just some super happy fun stuff happening in the world. And that's, uh, that, that's where I'm gonna end today's show. I wanted to leave you on a, on a happy note. The only thing certain in these times is that uh, things are uncertain. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I try and do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you don't miss these daily videos, which actually, if you did miss yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, you wanna watch that, click or tap right there. Or if you wanna see the newest behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.